We are doing a special Sunday morning edition of Community Forum, and we're very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Ted Rawl. Ted Rawl is a political cartoonist, opinion columnist, graphic novelist, and former radio show host. He has twice been awarded the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. His cartoons now appear in more than 100 publications around the United States, including the Los Angeles Times, Tucson Weekly, Willamette Week, New York Star-Ledger, Village Voice, and the New York Times. He is also author of numerous books, including To Afghanistan and Back, a graphic travelogue, Generalissimo El Busho, Essays and Cartoons on the Bush Years, Silk Road to Ruin, Is Central Asia the New Middle East, The Anti-American Manifesto, and he is here to talk about his new book, The Book of Obama, From Hope and Change to the Age of Revolt. Ted, thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. It's great to see you, Mike. Uh, so start out, tell us, what was your motivation in writing the Bush, uh, the book of Obama? Well, uh, two years ago, when I put out the Anti-American Manifesto, uh, one of the reactions to the book, which calls for the overthrow of the U.S. government, um, was that, what about Barack Obama? You know, here's a guy who's obviously, according to uh, many liberals, doing the best that he can, but facing obstruction uh, by the Republicans, and that's really the problem. That, that was an ar- a counter-argument that I kept hearing. And uh, I didn't see things that way. Uh, I saw Barack Obama as our Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, Eric Alterman said that Obama's the most progressive, liberal, well-intentioned, intelligent president that this system is capable of allowing to come to power, in the same way that Mikhail Gorbachev was really about the best leader that the Soviet system was, uh, was ever going to elevate. And the irony is that the Soviet people saw that because Gorbachev was an okay leader, but the system was still uh, not working for them, that the system was the problem. And uh, if, starting in 2009 with the Tea Party on the right and in 2011 with the Occupy Wall Street movement on the left, uh, we see a phenomenon. Obama has been the unwitting midwife of a revolutionary change in American politics. For the first time since the late 60s, early 70s, uh, Americans are heading back into the streets. We're no longer outsourcing our politics. Uh, We have a tendency here in the United States, almost unique to us, to look at uh, politics as something that we do on election day. We, We go vote, we put these leaders in charge, we figure they'll do a good job, and we check back on them two or four years later, and we vote accordingly based on what we find or what we are our impressions. In other countries, politics aren't like that at all. Politics happen every single day. They happen uh, with your, uh, over, over coffee with your friends. They, you talk about politics uh, over dinner with your, with your family. Uh, and in the United States, um, because we don't hold people accountable, our leaders accountable, on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis, uh, in the same way that they do in, say, Europe or in other countries, even in dictatorships, there's more accountability, ironically, because uh, people can go into the streets. There can be demonstrations, as we've seen during the Arab Spring. There can be uh, riots, revolutions, uprisings. But our leaders don't have to fear that. And uh, But Obama by being the least bad leader that we've seen for a while, still bad, but the least bad, uh, has, has, has exposed the nature of the system itself. Let's remember, the biggest problem in the United States today is, without a doubt, the economy and joblessness. Uh, you know, between 20 and 25 and 28, depending on how you count it, million people lost their jobs during the 2007 to 2009 fiscal meltdown. And n- these days... There is no discussion of trying to figure out how to put these people back to work. I mean, we're talking about anemic growth that's really effectively negative jobs growth. And what's fascinating, I think, to most people is that the political system doesn't even seriously engage the question as to how do we get 20 to 25 to 28 million people back to work. We think, well, you know, we'll slowly pull out of it over time. I mean, they're not talking about it. I mean, I'm not even saying... That the, that the solutions that Mitt Romney and Barack Obama are offering aren't enough, they're really not even seriously engaged in the discussion, and we end up talking about a lot of issues that are uh, not as pressing and not as important. I mean, you know, everything hinges on, on economic and political stability. Uh, if we go the way of the Soviet Union in 1991, you know, who, who knows what's going to come next? It's going to be really ugly, and we're going to forget about gay marriage, you know? I mean, it's uh, when, when cities are burning. So, um, you know, to me, the system was, ir- was ir- irredeemable from the start. Now it's unreformable. And the, uh, 
so so the uh, so really the 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 way I'm looking at Obama is he's a catalyst for change in the same way that uh, Gorbachev was. He's trying to save the system by trying to manage it and keep it going the way it was. The only way he really could have saved the system would have been to radically revamp it, but he was never going to do that. That was not his intention. So, and were you surprised at all by the complete uh, lack of action by, let's say, the Democratic Party once he came into power, I mean, to to do anything uh, even remotely progressive? I was surprised by the extent. You know, when when Bill Clinton came in uh, in 1993 and with a very similar ideology, uh, you know, Obama, people forget this, but during the primaries, you know, he was the conservative Democrat. John Edwards was the, the, the one to the left and slightly more to, and in the middle was Hillary Clinton. And then, you know, he was the conservative Democrat. Uh, he was a member of the Democratic Leadership Council, the Clintonian centrist triangulation Dick Morris outfit. So, uh, you know, ideologically, I wasn't surprised at all, but I thought, you know, this will be Bill Clinton all over again. You know, the, the smart money in Washington said, we're going to see a cabinet that looked with a lot of Clinton, Clintonista retreads. But really, that didn't happen so much. I mean, I was shocked when Paul Krugman didn't get the nod for Treasury or a Fed. Um, you know, he was the guy who was right about the housing uh, bubble and, you know, all along and, and is widely respected instead. You know, we got Timothy Geithner and these uh, Goldman Sachs hacks who were wrong about everything. Forget about, again, the ideology. It's just they were mistaken. Uh, There was not a single progressive uh, appointed to a cabinet, senior cabinet level position uh, in the in the Obama uh, administration. Remember, we had Robert Reich in the in the first uh, 19 in the first Clinton cabinet. He didn't last long. Uh, and Locked in the Cabinet is a book that everyone should read if they really want to know what happens to liberals in, in a Democratic uh, administration. But I was surprised by the extent of the complete freeze-out. I mean, liberals are the base of the Democratic Party in the same way that conservatives are the base of the Republican Party. And you you expect any kind of intelligent administration uh, of a po- political party to include every strain of its of its ideological backers in its in the way that it governs but with obama that has not been the case i mean there's been a little bit of lip service to liberalism in some ways but usually as in gay marriage after the people have already led the way i mean you know if obama had never said that came out in favor of gay marriage gay marriage was going to be legalized anyway he's following the people uh you know we needed a leader uh to push for progressive principles because they were really the principles that were going to get us out of this economic disaster. So I, I'm sure you've heard as well as I have that a lot of the uh, of our so-called elected officials, our leaders, say that well they can't do anything unless there's you know a push from the people themselves. You know, so um, have you been surprised by the uh, up until the Occupy movement the complete lack of push from uh, any of its citizenry? You know, I, yeah, I, I'm always surprised at how long it takes. But I guess, you know, historically, people tend to, all, historians are always surprised by how long it takes for people to get angry. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're tolerant sheeple. We put up with a lot. And, it, it, and then finally, people just can't take it anymore, and they head out into the streets. I mean, even now, the reaction is not what you, uh, you know, what you would expect in terms of scale. I mean, when you consider that you have the low, lowest labor participation rate uh, in the workforce since the 1930s, which means, you know, the real unemployment rate is over 20 percent. When you have, uh, you know, if they calculated it the way they did back in the 30s, the rate's very similar to the height of the Great Depression. The misery is everywhere. What's striking is that it's so hidden. You know, people, instead of lining up for bread and selling apples for a nickel on the street, you know, they're double and tripling and, and quadrupling up on their on their relatives' couches. It's all, you know, people are, are lending each other money that they know that they're never going to re- be able to repay. I mean, you know, we're spiraling down the toilet, and yet it's, uh, you know, it's, sec- it's hidden. And people, I think what's happened is that um, people are internalizing their misery and their anger. You know, they're turning it against themselves. They think that it's their fault. You know, they lost their job. Uh, it's somehow, if you know, and, and the system and the media really play into this. They say, like, well, you know, you should, you know, this day and age, you have to learn, build your own website. You have to blog. You have to, uh, you have to learn how to market yourself. You can't work for one company your entire life. You have to retrain. Well, really? You have to retrain with what money? You got laid off. You don't have any money to retrain, and your salary's been shrinking for 40 years, so you don't have any savings. It's not your fault. 
and someone needs to tell the people that it's the government's duty to try to provide a, the, the basic essentials of life to the citizenry, especially in a country as rich as this. So has this always been part of our culture? Do you think it's been amped up uh, in the last, you know, who knows, uh, 10, 20 years in terms of uh, conditioning us? Uh, you know, I, I think it's accelerating. The, you know, the, 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 the propaganda of the, of the media has become so much more effective in the same way that we're able to do direct marketing. You know, we know, the compu you know your, your computer knows that, you know, what kind of products to pitch you, right, based on your surfing habits. And the political propaganda machine is nearly as sophisticated as that. Um, you know, they're, they're able to know exactly how to push our buttons in a way that we're that makes us uh, look at um, you know for instance resort to xenophobia or, um, or or to turn against each other rather than against the system itself. I mean, we have learned to expect nothing from our government. I mean that we're told that every day. It's like, well, don't expect anything. You know, this isn't a nanny state. You're on your own. It's like, really? Okay, if I'm on my own fine, then I don't want to pay any taxes at all, and I don't want to pay, and I should be able to park my car wherever I want. I don't want to pay a meter, and, and if I want to drive as fast as I can, I don't want to pay any speeding tickets. If I'm on my own, I want, to, I want the benefits of being on my own. But it seems to me that the system that we're living in now is a system in which I'm on my own when it comes to expecting anything from this vast government infrastructure that is that is raping us financially uh, and, all, and in other ways. And it's, uh, but when it comes to, uh, you know, it doesn't work, it only works one way. And it's the same thing in the workforce. You know, your, your uh, employers want to hire people who are pre-trained. It wasn't like that 40 years ago. 40 years ago, you know, if a, if a company found, uh, had a job to fill and they couldn't find enough, you know, you hear this all the time. You know, we can't find the skilled workers. It's so many unemployed people, but we can't find people trained in tool and die to fill our, our, our positions. Really? So hire smart people and send them to school the way that employers have done for hundreds of years. And, you know, but now it's like, no, you have to work for free in an unpaid internship and you have to go to school on your own dime and then pay massive exorbitant student loan interest that will enslave you for the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, you know, everything's on our shoulders. We have to bag our own groceries, pump our own gas, pay our own education, do our own, pay for our own retraining, suck it up when we're unemployed and our unemployment benefits run out. It's all on our own. And, it, it, you know, they've gone too far. They just have pushed us too far, and it's just over. And it's it's you know the rebellion has begun. It's going to be in fits and starts, but there's no turning back now. They have just pushed it too far. So, uh, what do you see as potential solutions and/or steps towards this revolt? Well, you know the when I wrote the Anti-American Manifesto a couple of years ago, um, what I argued was that the system is going to collapse anyway of its own accord. And uh, it would sure be better, uh, as messy and danger and violent as a revolution will be. I can't say can be; it will be. Uh, to it would be better to have a revolution and manage that change uh, rather than just have a collapse happen. I mean, it would be nice to save the infrastructure that we have now. It would be better to not st see stuff burn. Um, but that's. Uh, but I think that we're gonna we're still heading into a collapse mode. I mean, there is effectively no left in the United States. And that's, and I, you know, I'm not saying that I'm a cartoonist, I ex I'm prone to exaggeration. But what I mean is, yes, we have liberals, we have progressives, but they're in, they work in service to the Democratic Party. They're part of the system itself. We don't have a left, which is to say an engaged, organized force that is dedicated to radical political, economic, and social change that is interested in not re re bringing back the Glass-Steagall Act, not in these kind of reformist moves, but in actually changing, rethinking everything about the way we live as people and in our relationship with each other and with the world. There is no group like that in the United States. And so, you know, there's, there's just a few random authors and there's our collected thoughts and, you know, there's, there's really enticing poll numbers like the 2009 polls that showed uh, incredible support for socialism and communism as economic systems in a country this conservative. It was surprising. But so I don't think that, um, you know, as much as I do hope that there will be an organization that will form spontaneously, and I think it's possible, 
that that will happen. I also don't think it's going to take decades to organize anymore. I think with the internet, uh, everything is different. You know, the the internet is a tool of oppression. It's also a tool of organization and resistance. Every technology cuts both ways. And um, so I think things just move a lot faster. Uh, you know, an organization could pop up overnight, and within a year, we could be having a completely different conversation. Uh, but I think right now, if I have to put my money on it, we're just headed toward collapse. It's just things are just going to get worse and worse and worse and more dystopian all the time. Well, at the same time that this uh, left uh, uh, infrastructure could be coming about, I mean, we're also looking at uh, extremes on on other sides, like, uh, let's say, the Tea Party and the um, the uh, Republican Party, which appears to be completely co-opted by the, the Tea Party at this point. Are you worried about that? Well, yeah, that's and that's a big part of my concern. I mean, you know, in in this country, the right is very well organized, and um, they're and they are convinced that they're besieged by the left. I mean, it's it's uh, they're living in a fantasy world. You know, I mean, I, I did a cartoon recently where I said, you know. I would vote for like the the right wing caricature of Barack Obama as a socialist Kenyan born Alinsky worshipping uh, you know radical. I would I like that guy except that he doesn't exist. Uh, and and it's what's disturbing is uh, you know it's been pointed out that you're entitled to your opinion but you're not entitled to your own facts. Well, I mean you know the the ideology of this country as a quote unquote mainstream in its media and uh, what is acceptable in mainstream political uh, discourse has been moving, I'm 48 years old, has been moving to the right my entire life through Democratic and Republican regimes alike. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's hard to imagine Barack Obama being considered far enough to the left for the Republican Party of 1960. Um, he would be, he would have been considered a crazy right-wing lunatic to be able, you know, we go to war without asking Congress uh, all the time, you know, every time there's any kind of, uh, you know, little entanglement like Syria, uh, you know, he, you know, I don't think uh, Eisenhower or even Richard Nixon would have countenanced the idea that it's okay for a president to sign off on the assassination of an American citizen on American soil with nothing more than the stroke of a presidential a pen. Um, and similarly, you know, Barack, I mean, uh, Barry Goldwater, who was uh, considered a wild-eyed right-wing lunatic who was going to blow up the world in 1964, today would be too far to the left for today's Democratic Party. I mean, that's how far the whole, the, the, the needle has moved over. And, you know, I mean, th those people are, uh, you know, they're a big concern to me. Um, the Tea Party, um, you know, st he, the, the basic idea of the Tea Party is somewhat noble. Let's go back to constitution, constitutional purity. Um, let's let's get the government out of our lives. But the the cart, what's happened is it's been completely bought and purchased by the Koch brothers and other corporate interests. And uh, and what's happening is that these very naive political babies that joined the Tea Party are you know, have, have basic, they're rubes and they're babes in the woods and they're wet behind the ears. Any other metaphor you want, um, they're, they're being, they're being taken advantage of and their instincts as quote unquote patriots are being directed into xenophobia, gay bashing, and also all manner of, of hatred and contempt of anything that smacks of socialism or leftism, even though really the, the complaints that they have are really left wing complaints. You know, I mean, you're complaining about banksters gone wild. Well, l listen, you know, that's that's some, you know, leftists are the natural enemies of bankers, not rightists. So do you see any opening there for dialogue amongst people who are uh, participating in the Tea Party? And I do, actually. And, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of my local Occupy movement in, in Long Island, where I live, in New York. And, uh, you know, we, we often talk about this. Uh, I think that um, revolution, you know, that people who oppose the state should get together regardless of where they stand on the ideological spectrum and form alliances of convenience. And we can always, as uh, Ahmed Shah Massoud, who organized the Afghan resistance against the Soviets in the 80s, famously said, you know, first we kill the Russians, next we kill each other. Uh, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's get together. And, um, you know, I, there's a lot of people on the right who I think have a better understanding of the nature of the system than some liberals who really still think that if they go out and support Barack Obama, that he's going to bust out and become a liberal progressive, you know, as a lame duck. I mean, everybody's forgetting what happens in a second term, which is the day he takes office, 
the, the new president is a lame duck and, you know, doesn't really, even if he wants to, get much done. Second terms, are, I don't even know why presidents want second terms. They never do anything. They can't. So, I mean, no, you're not getting liberal Obama in, in, in you know, next year if he wins. It's, it's just, it's not going to happen. And so, uh, you know, I think that, like, liberals don't need to understand that. We are talking with Ted Rawl. He is author of the new book, The Book of Obama. From Hope and Change to the Age of Revolt, and in addition to your many books, uh, you have a great website where people can access a lot of your, your resources. Yeah, it's uh, rawl.com, R-A-L-L.com. All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. Thanks for thank having me. I thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. It was awesome, and everyone should call in and, and like send in massive amounts of money. <laughs>